All right, so grocery shopping for Hartel. Before we talk about grocery shopping, hold on, let me move this little box out of the way. We kind of have to talk about what heart disease is. Um, heart disease is the number one killer of both men and women in the United States, but really it's the number one killer across the world um, for men and women, and it's the highest killer for all ethnicities and races as well. So heart disease can present typically as ischemic or coronary artery disease, that's most commonly what you've heard of. And basically what that means is the narrowing of arteries leading to the heart, which then prevents blood flow and oxygen from effectively reaching the heart. Um, so that's the number one killer, like significantly higher than the next. Um, it can also present as heart, heart arrhythmias. So that's going to be an irregular heartbeat, whether it's slow, um, tachycardia, bradycardia, fast, or just an irregular heartbeat. Generally, this is a problem because it's associated with a higher risk of blood clots. And if you have a higher risk of blood clots, then you typically have a higher risk for what? Stroke. Um, so a stroke then is kind of being the same thing as what would lead to a heart attack, the narrowing of the arteries, causing a blood clot leading to the brain, which prevents oxygen and blood flow to the brain. Um, cardiomyopathy, which is actually the disease of the heart muscle itself. It stops pumping as effectively, whether it's hardening or stiffening or whatever. And therefore, if you're not getting proper pumping, you're not properly, properly pumping blood to the rest of the body. Um, valvular problems, there's a couple different ways this can happen. There can be stenosis, which again is the hardening of those valves. So it can't pump the blood in or out. You can have regurgitation, which is exactly kind of what it sounds like, where it's coming back out the other end. So think of like acid reflux, that flap doesn't completely close, so the acid comes back up, the blood goes back where it's not supposed to. Um, and there's also prolapse of the valve. So whether they um, go in on themselves or kind of pulled out, which again would obviously make it not effectively pump. And there's a couple other options, but these are kind of the most popular ways that heart disease will present itself. What? <laughs> These are the most common ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so risk factors. Unfortunately, age is a risk factor because as we get older, it is common for things to start to slow down. Now, age is always linked to certain illnesses because of the way that we tend to age, but it's not necessarily normal that makes sense. But we always say age because as we get older, things tend to shut down. There are things that we can do to prevent that though. Um, sex, again, being a female does put us a little bit more at risk of getting heart disease, but again, it is the number one killer for men and women. Um, a family history of heart disease or heart issues. And now when I talk to uh, clients about this, you know, we talk about genetics and people sometimes be like, well, I have a family history, so that just means I'm gonna get it, right? No. Genes load the gun. Our lifestyle and our diet is what pulls the trigger and we control that. So yes, if you have the mentality that I'm gonna get it, hey, then you're gonna get it. But unfortunately it means if you want to prevent it, you have to work that much harder to prevent it. Smoking, the biggest reason for this being a risk factor is that it causes atherosclerosis. So it causes the hardening of those arteries and that makes it harder to pump blood through. Um, a poor diet, generally in the past, we've always talked about, you know, if you eat lots of bad saturated fatty foods, that's the number one cause, but more research, because it's always ever changing, we were just talking about this, is more sugars and refined carbohydrates and processed foods are really the driving factor. Um, physical inactivity, Again, physical inactivity or physical activity helps with circulation. You know, this thing is the new smoking. So even just not moving all day long, even if you regularly exercise after sitting at a desk for eight hours, still increases your risk because we're not getting up and moving and getting that circulation going. Um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. Again, they're all affecting those arteries in some way and they're all linked together. They are all part of metabolic syndrome and stress and insufficient sleep. So these two things are things that tended to kind of get put on the back burner in the past and more and more, I'm gonna be bold and say new research is showing that stress and sleep are maybe even more important than diet and exercise and are actually the foundation before you get to that step. Why? When we're stressed, what happens to our body? 
Inflammation. Inflammation. Inflammation is one of the biggest driving factors in every single chronic illness. And in the past, stress is not necessarily bad, but in the past, stress was an acute reaction to getting chased by a cyber tooth tiger, for instance. It was a short bout of stress to put us into that fight or fight or flight response, and then it would go away. In this day and age, we have deadlines, we have work, we have social media, we have mainstream media, we have politics, we have all the BS, and we are in a constant state of stress all of the time. And if we're in a constant state of stress, we are never reaching that normal homeostatic state where our blood pressure is normal, where our heart rate is normal, where our respiration rate is normal, where our digestion is normal. That slows when we're stressed. All of that affects your health and your weight. And same with sleep. Like sleep is probably the number one thing that we need to work on in this country because the majority of us get less than six hours a night. And we need about seven to eight hours, seven to nine hours um, for the average person to really truly get that deep sleep that they need where they're repairing, they're recovering, and they're regulating their hormones normally. If we're not regulating that and we're not repairing, then we're not effectively you know, our body's not being effective. And so that's why sleep and stress are also so important. Lifestyle factors. So again, kind of dove, dove into this already, but manage your stress in a healthy way. So managing your stress, key ways are going to be, you know, physical activity. And when I say physical activity for stress management, I mean more light exercise type activities. Because we have to remember that strenuous exercise in itself is a stressful activity. So this would be going for a walk, um, maybe some yoga. That's my personal go-to because if you do actual Hatha yoga, yoga, you will feel it the next day. You will be sore, but it also focuses so much on your breath. And breath work is another technique. That's actually the number one technique. Most of you who have attended these before, I always say breathing techniques, the four, seven, eight breath. So you breathe in for a count of four, you hold for a count of seven, with the tongue on the roof of your mouth behind your teeth, you breathe out for a count of eight and you do that for a cycle of three. What this does is it actually turns off the sympathetic nervous system and it turns off that fight or flight response. So breathing is the number one thing you can do. Going for a walk, I already said that. Um, taking a bath, hot, you know, a hot shower, reading, listening to music, journaling, gratitude practice, which in the past I have mentioned, people who practice gratitude are 20% healthier and you're like, both of you were like, how do you measure that? Yeah. So the, the way they measure it is they do the Harvard happiness study. They do like a questionnaire. But so it's based off like their responses before something and then their responses after something. And there's responses changed after practicing gratitude practice. I did look into that. So that is how they determine that. Um, staying physically active. And so this, when you're talking about physical activity in itself, would be, you know, strength training, maybe more high intensity interval training, um, but getting moving, getting active, because it does, it releases endorphins, that happy hormone that reduces your cortisol, um, control your other health conditions, again, your blood pressure, your diabetes, um, your, or just glucose in general, don't smoke, maintain a healthy weight, the more weight that we carry, the more stress that our body is under, um, eat a nutritious diet, which we are going to talk about. That's kind of the point of this, this um, lunch and learn, and then get enough quality sleep. So not only is it the length of the sleep, but the quality of the sleep. We really want that deep, um, restful sleep to repair and recover. So grocery guide. Before you go, we view the store's weekly ad, um, look for deals and coupons. You've always want a good deal, right? Create a menu for the week. This can be extremely helpful and you can choose. It doesn't have to be every single meal, but you might find it helpful to be like, these days are particularly busy. I want to plan meals for, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays because I know that I get home late. And if I don't, then we're going to be pulling something out of the freezer. We're going to be stopping on the way home and include snacks. You know, plan healthy snacks that you can just grab on the go so that you're not grabbing chips out of the vending machine or whatever. As I stare at Andy while he crunches on his chips, just kidding. <laughs> Write your list based on the layout of your particular store so you're not crossing, you know, one side to the other. Unless you want the exercise, that's fine too. Um, and then eat a snack before you go so that you're not just grabbing the specials off the hubcaps or hub, what do they call those? Not hubcaps, yeah, yeah, yeah. caps. Yeah, there you go. They're not called hubcaps. If you're really hungry. So don't go to the store hungry. Yes, do not go to the store hungry. That's where it, that's where it gets you. All right, so produce. I would argue that you don't need a 
you know, they, they push vegan and vegetarian diets, which some people do well on, but I would say a plant rich diet. So that means you're still eating meat, but we probably could eat a lot less meat than we do as a country. And we need to eat more fresh fruits, well, not necessarily even fresh, but more produce, more fruits, vegetables, plant-based foods, um, shop the rainbow. Why? Because every different color in a piece of fruit or vegetable needs a different antioxidant. And each antioxidant is going to pro provide you with certain benefits. And also we found that there's not really a way to determine the um, content or amount in anything, but phytochemicals are seemingly really important to help us with our health because phytochemicals are what the plant creates as a defense to stop being eaten or whatever. So like the bitterness in foods are actually extremely healthy for us because it's the plant's mechanism to not get eaten. That just so it doesn't work. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Well, by other animals, yes. But a lot of people don't like bitter or foods, them. especially if they're a hyper, uh, what is it called? Aren't you one of these? A super taster. Like they don't, they tend to not like bitter foods because they, they're bitter. They don't taste good. So that prevents animals from eating them and the plant survives. But us eating that is healthy for us. Um, a good tip is to purchase pre-cut produce or salad. I mean, I know it's more expensive, but your time is also valuable too. So you have to determine what is more important. Is it easier for you to eat healthy if you already have a, the cut up fruit or the bag of salad that's washed and ready to go? Um, so you have to determine and weigh your options there. Stock up on the produce you like. I get a lot of people that are like, well, I only like bananas, oranges, carrots, and celery. Okay, so then just eat those things, like have those things on hand. Um, if, and you know, I also challenge you to try a new thing, maybe something you've never had, like a parsnip or I don't know, some random food that you've never had. Try it because you don't know that you don't like it until you've tried it, which is what I tell my three year old. So, <laughs> still doesn't work. Yeah, typically it does not, but um, use overripe, uh, overripe produce for soups and smoothies um, and you know, only buy what you need on hand so that you're not wasting your dollars or freeze it or can it or whatever. There's lots of techniques that you can use. So again, these contain a variety of nutrients that protect the heart. Some of them right here, these are just a small amount, but potassium supports healthy blood pressure. So that's good to have. Lycopene, which is found in red foods, like tomatoes is the primary food that we think of, prevents inflammation. So that's a good thing to have. And vitamin K, which is going to be found in your green leafy vegetables like spinach, kale, cruciferous vegetables, helps with artery flexibility. And a good thing to note too is that Right now, um, we were already talking about vitamin D. Most people are low in vitamin D. You really wanna couple vitamin D3 with K2, vitamin K2, because that's more effectively absorbed that way. So get in your green leafy vegetables. And monounsaturated fats promote heart health. And so those are gonna be found more in like plant foods like avocados, olives, nuts and seeds. Olive oil. Yep, and olive oil, yep. So deli and bakery. So I like to talk about this one because again, it's kind of a convenience factor. Um, you know, picking up a, a rotisserie chicken and then using the leftovers to create to, to create um, chicken salad, enchiladas, whatever. You can freeze it for later. You can still go to the deli and get a healthier salad. They have broccoli crunch or they have kale crunch or whatever. Opt for whole grain buns and rolls if you're going to choose them because at least they're going to have a little bit more fiber. Um, and then they also do have lots of healthy sides. So like water dips, like guacamole, salsa, hummus, you can use these instead of ranch or, I mean, not always, but you know, it's a good alternative. I personally am not a big mayo person. So I like to use avocado because I feel like you get the same texture. It's obviously not the same flavor, but some alternatives. Breads. So the number one thing going into carbs is that really we should try to get our carbohydrates as much as possible from things that are not in boxes or bags or have barcodes. So really, you know, produce, um, including potatoes, root vegetables, those are heavily carb-based foods. And then foods that are in bags that only have one or two ingredients. So like brown rice, the ingredient in brown rice, it's in a bag and it has a barcode, but it's brown rice. Um, so going with less ingredients, the better. The less ingredients, the less refined that it generally is. So they recommend six to eight ounces of grains, and they really recommend that at least half of those be whole grains. Does everyone know the difference between a whole grain and a simple grain? And a simple grain. So a whole grain or a complex carbohydrate and a simple carbohydrate. So simple carbohydrate is going to be white bread, white rice, anything that's white flour based. 
basically the nutrients have been entirely removed. They've stripped it and they've removed the endosperm, the germ and the bran, which is like basically all of the healthy nutrition and the fiber, they've removed that. And it's just white. <laughs> so stay away from the white foods. A complex carbohydrate is, contains all of that. It generally hasn't been too refined, um, but it has been processed and it's gonna contain the fiber and all of the regular nutrients that it's supposed to. There's something that's kind of in the middle, which is called an enriched grain. And this is a grain that was refined. And then they add a certain level of nutrition back into it, but it's not necessarily the same profile that it was. So it doesn't necessarily have the same nutrients that it once did. They're not necessarily in the proper ratio. So it's like the better option if you can pick it, but whole grain is still gonna be the best. The way that it's digested, a simple carb like white bread, which white bread actually spikes your glucose higher than simple sugar for reference. Um, but so that simple carbohydrate is just a simple chain, a lot of, like a line. So you digest it very quickly. So when we're tired, we tend to gravitate towards these foods because we know we're going to get that boost of energy. And then we crash because it's utilized very quickly. Whereas that complex carbohydrate is like the root of a tree where it's very branched. So it takes longer to digest, which means we don't get necessarily that same boost, but we get a more steady energy supply and it doesn't spike and drop our blood sugar, which is important. Um, when we do have whole grains, they, again, they contain the, that fiber, which I mentioned, B vitamins are found in a lot of whole grain products, um, iron, magnesium. And then, like I said, you want to pick a whole grain item that has a whole grain listed first. So it should list wheat or oats or barley or rye. The first ingredient listed shouldn't be white flour or oil or whatever you want it or sugar. Lots of things have sugar listed first. Um, choosing options with at least three grams of fiber. And they do have the whole grain stamp for easy identification. Pasta and rice, very similar guidelines. Try to make half um, whole grains as much as possible. You know, try to get your carbs for things without a barcode. So choosing like the, the brown rice or the wild rice instead of maybe a whole wheat pasta, even though it's still technically like whole wheat and egg. It's, you know, a little bit more refined than the, the rice. Um, select items with the whole grain list first. And brown rice is a budget friendly option at 10 cents per serving. You can also make a big batch like on Monday and it'll still be good through the end of the week to throw veggies and protein and whatever on. So that's a meal prep tip. Read the ingredient label. That's probably the number one thing that I recommend to people, you know, know what's in your food. Very often we just pick it off the shelf, throw it in our cart. Read the label, read the ingredients. Um, do you recognize what's on the ingredients? You know, if it says egg, milk, and salt, and that would be like cottage cheese, well, that's daisy cottage cheese. And then you look at the reduced fat brownies brand, and it's the ingredients label is this long, and there's about seven things in there that you have no idea what is. Do you really want to eat that? You want to eat the foods that are made of whole foods. Um, these can help your help reduce your risk for heart disease. Cereal and granola. In general, the cereal and granola that we do have on the market is pretty much breakfast candy. I'm not going to lie. Um, you should pretty much steer away from it as much as possible. I know I really try not to get hard on that. Um, check the label and look at the sugars because a lot of times the sugar is, I remember General Mills, they were trying to change the stipulation to like get the sugar under a certain level. I can't remember what it was like 33% of the calories. I don't know. It was like a ridiculous amount. And General Mills was like, no, we can't do that. Literally none of our cereals would fit that kind like that. And that's what our like, people give their kids for breakfast. That's insane. Um, good options should have low sugar and high fiber. So that's literally going to be like bran. And even those are still, you know, not the greatest or like oatmeal. Um, but it's interesting to note that everybody's body is different too. And so the way that you process these things might be different. So like oatmeal is always touted as a very healthy food. Um, with my second pregnancy, I had gestational diabetes. And I found personally for me, oats skyrocketed my blood sugar, like ridiculously. So now I don't eat them. I used to think, you know, oatmeal is a good healthy breakfast to have on hand for me. And for me personally, it's not. And so if you ever get the chance to, you know, check your blood sugar or have like a continuous glucometer, which I'm super interested in. I feel like that's where we're headed as like medical so that you can see, so you can see, what? 
<laughs> it's pretty good maintenance. It's all We're just gonna go hooked up on the PM schedule. Yeah, yeah. Right. we'll take some. Well, it's like a little monitor that's on your arm. It's a cyborg. Yeah. Well, people system. with like type yeah. one diabetes needs need that to like stay alive. Yeah. But I oh, think right. that, and it's not something that you would wear like forever. But it would be something because it's going to be individualized nutrition and medicine for you specifically. Like you're going to find out just because oats bite my blood sugar through the roof, they might be perfectly fine for you. But like sweet potatoes might sk skyrocket your blood sugar and they're fine for me. So I feel like that's kind of where we're headed. But it's interesting to note, you know, just because someone says it's healthy for the general population doesn't mean it's healthy for you. And then I do have try overnight oats for an easy grab and go breakfast. Not for me, though. <laughs> um, again, reading the ingredient label is extremely important. Watch that fiber content. Generally, we want at least three grams or more. If something has 20% or more of your daily value in it, it's a good source of that vitamin or mineral or nutrient. If it has 5% or less, it's a poor source. And if it's in between, it's kind of a good but not great source. So, like, we definitely want high fiber. We want, you know, high calcium, high magnesium. We want to avoid more of like the trans fat, the saturated fat, that type of thing. Canned goods. So these are something that I feel like sometimes get a bad rep and it tends to be because they do tend to have more sodium in them for canning purposes and pre preservation. Um, but you can still buy low or no salt added. And if those are, you know, kind of not budget friendly, Simply buying the regular stuff and draining and rinsing them before you use them significantly cut that sodium amount. These are nice because they tend to be budget friendly. They tend to last a long time. You can keep them in your desk drawer or maybe not in your car because you probably don't want them in there in the summer when they're going to like blow up. But um, pick options that are packed in water or 100% juice for the fruit. Um, and a pinch, simply drain and rinse. Canned beans are extremely budget-friendly protein source, and they also have a lot of fiber and other nutrition, and they're, um, again, a good protein source that are not meat-based if you're going that route. Um, and you can also put, like, fresh fruit on salads or oatmeal or in smoothies. Again, read that label. Choose no salt added or low salt sodium. Um, beans actually contain resistant starches, which have been shown to help lower LDL and triglycerides and Again, what cholesterol tends to be one of the driving factors for heart disease. At least that's what they previously said. Now research is kind of going away from there. <laughs> Again, ever changing. Meat, daily recommendation, five and a half to six and a half ounces of protein. So serving sizes, roughly three ounces of cooked meat um, or a deck of cards. And again, this serving size is very generalized. Um, it's not individualized, and I do think that we're changing to, we were just talking about this the other day, that I think protein has always been minimized on the amount that we need, and now we're slowly saying less carbohydrates, not low carbohydrate, but less carbohydrates and more lean proteins and healthy fats is kind of the way nutrition research is headed. Some of what I heard, though, with, with, with meats was the reason why you don't want to use it as a or primaries are too big of a source of protein is because of um, levels. The hormones that are found in most of our meats, because most of them are factory farms, so it's hormones, and they find that I think at the age 40 and over, those hormones have a detrimental effect on your health. Yep. Stuff that would be good for you when you were in your teens is now detrimental to your health. Yep, and quality and sourcing is definitely something that people need to take into consideration too if that's you know like I do personally try to get more grass-fed meat if I can um, so that's but that's entirely again an individual decision on you know which source they want to make and like I had mentioned before I do think as a country we do tend to rely on animal protein a little too much I think we could reduce it but not it, I don't think that we need to be vegan necessarily either no. There's the, uh, there a really good Netflix documentary called Can We Talk About this? Probably. The Game Changers okay. about protein yeah. from a plant based diet, which is, you know, it's not the way most people will operate, including me, but really going away from meat, which is a big farm. Too. Right. Well, they heard what was it? Wonder a lot of what I heard in some of the advice was you don't necessarily have to cut meat out of your diet, simply replacing four meals a week. Greatly reduce your chances of harm caused by consuming the 
for written comments. Yeah, and I, that's kind of what I'm saying, you know, reducing, knowing the sourcing, um, getting local if you can. And I think, you know, there's always going to be controversy. There's always going to be, I've heard, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I hear people, experts on both sides on why you should be vegetarian or vegan, why you should include, you know, grass fed um, meats, why you should reduce it, why, you know, Cody, Cody. Casey mentioned, I'm thinking Cody, because we were talking about Cody before, um, that there's the carnivore diet now. Like, there's always going to be people who are on either side. And I think just finding that happy medium. And that's where I like, I think meat is an important part of the diet. I think, you know, doing your research and determining what source is the best for you. I do think reducing meat consumption and just increasing plants. I mean, it's not like re reduce meats completely, but we do need to up our plant consumption. That is 100% sure we do not get enough phytonutrients, vitamins, minerals, which are mostly going to be found in those plants. We don't eat enough variety of plants either is the thing. And unfortunately, though, we also live in Wisconsin where we can only grow so much and we are transporting so much in too. And that's a huge thing too. But those plant-based meats, they get a lot of salt in them. A lot of Oh yeah. What is that like? The impossible. Version? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am one hundred percent do not support any type of no. Meat. Like if you're gonna eat a a veggie burger, then I suggest like a black bean like, burger, yeah, where at least you can yeah. read the ingredients and it's like black bean, salt, whatever, or like a portobello mushroom as a burger. Like impossible. What's the other one? Beyond. Yeah, yeah Beyond Burgers, like. Those are just genetically, like there's so many things in there. Yeah. But again, if you don't know what they are, you really want to eat they them. They also don't grow well. I found out they can only they really do it quickly. You cannot <laughs> caramelize a Beyond Meat sausage. It just simply burns. That's the one of the proteins that lead to the main artery actions. It's my apologies to case two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so meat is a good source of yes. vitamins. Yes. Um, it is important to note too that iron, a lot of people have, you know, an iron deficiency and while there are foods that plant based foods that do contain iron, it's non heme and it's not as absorbable as the heme version, which is found in plant uh, meats. Um, so that is good to note. Uh, choose 90% lean ground beef if you can, um, drain the fat or rinse to reduce fat content. But there's a lot of information too now that, you know, the fat is not as bad. Fat does not make us fat. It's really sugar and find carbohydrates that are driving that. Again, read the label. Oh wait, I just went backwards. I went backwards. Seafood, this is another thing. You know, seafood is a really good lean source of protein and we probably do not eat it enough, especially because of where we live. Um, fatty fish like tuna and salmon contain omega-3 fatty acids, which are protective against heart disease. Um, Non-fatty fish are also great lean, great lean protein sources. If you're looking for a vitamin D boost, sardines and anchovies, so the little fish that we eat um, are actually the best source of vitamin D as far as food goes because you're eating their bones and that's where you store vitamin D. Um, because really the only source we otherwise have it from is the sun, which when you live in Wisconsin is not really a great source. Um, and then it's enriched in foods like milk or juice or they do have like some breakfast cereals. But again, we already talked about breakfast cereal not being a great option. So supplementation D3 is the other too, option. D two, D three, yes, D three, yep. Paired with K two, and but I did actually see some research. So it is B twelve, not D twelve. But there is yes, some right. research that pairing D three with B twelve is also more effective way of absorbing it. I think it's more of like the up and coming research, um, but that is also uh, a possibility. So animal fats contain saturated fat, fat which can contribute to plaque buildup. Um, and that's why they generally say to limit saturated fat to 60% of calories. Um, try limiting red wheat, meat to once a week, incorporate at least one serving of fish. Again, these are the guidelines that they have now, but I do think there's some wiggle room and they're starting to change a little bit. Is pork red meat? No, pork is considered white meat. Fats, oils, and spices. Cooking with these are important because again, they contain, they're a plant food. We don't really think of herbs, especially when they're dried if we don't have them fresh, but they contain a lot of phytochemicals and nutrients that are important. Um, and they can add flavor without adding that sodium salt or fat. Tropical oils do contain saturated fat and should be used sparingly. Um, this one, I feel like, you know, people just don't realize that palm, if they're being told to re remove saturated fat, that palm, palm kernel and coconut oil do contain saturated fat. But for the general person who doesn't have a serious cholesterol problem, it's probably a good option to cook with. 
Olive and avocado oils contain healthy monounsaturated and omega-3 fats. So Mark, you had asked about that. Yep, olive oil is a great option to cook with. Um, Steven is a great person for this though, but you don't want to use olive oil for high temperature cooking because it has a low smoking point. You want to use more like avocado or I don't know if you have another suggestion for higher, like if you're stir frying, you don't really want to use yeah, olive oil. Yeah, oil is a good choice, but otherwise actually cooking oil has got a really good smoke. Yep, and so I would use that then because I do think, you know, again, saturated fat gets a little bit more of a bad rep than we <laughs> it actually needs. Um, try using no salt seasonings. Oh, like lard? Yeah, lard. Lard's got a really good smoke point as well. And very healthy. Oh, right. what about, what about yeah. ghee? Yeah, ghee is good, but you got to watch. So ghee is similar to olive oil in the sense that not all ghee is the same. Okay. And some is meant for cooking and some is meant for drugging. Some is if you mix the wires. One direction doesn't matter, and the other has your house looking like a firefighting. Okay. I don't know. So being careful with that. <laughs> Attention matters. Yes, yes. Um, drizzle extra olive, olive uh, extra virgin olive oil instead of using butter. But again, I think butter is still a better option than margarine. Um, yeah, I was just listening to a little butter. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I, don't, I think they were selling. Butter is bad. Yeah, they're first vegetables. Does anybody make it? I mean, it's probably all in moderation, but I will say that. <laughs> Heavily refined vegetable oils are not good. So, like the you know canola, um, soybean, those oils they're finding are re you know we we really said that fat was the devil basically in like what was it like the seventies eighties and everything became low fat. But when you remove fat, you have to put something in it to make it more palatable. And so oftentimes that's sugar and sodium. And so. The latest thing I heard too was that when they removed all the fat, like heart disease has actually increased then since removing that. And so again, it's like this delicate balance of yeah, finding out what. Hmm? Yeah, you gotta lube up. Say, have yeah, something greased the bones. <laughs> but more and more, it's like yes, um, copious amounts of certain saturated fats are probably not healthy, but also sugar and refined carbs are really that number one driving factor. I mean, it's just the the amount of processed, refined, highly processed foods. Not just processed, because when you say processed, that could be like, yeah, I feel like processed is just going to be like, so that bag of brown rice was processed, but it's not really refined. Whereas, you know, the sour cream old fashioned donut was highly processed to be created. Like it has additives beyond whole foods. Right, like right. You start seeing Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if you look at the label and it's like, okay, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna buy a loaf of bread from the bakery and it has, you know, wheat, it has eggs, it has milk, it has salt, it has like whole foods that you can identify and you know it's a whole food. That's like a, a refined food. When you start adding in the red dye, thirty and the sodium benzoate and I don't even know, you know, things that you can't pronounce, that's when it's highly processed. Yes. Yep. And so the hydrogenated oils too. Yeah. You want to prevent or remove those as much as possible. That's what trans fat is. is Are they always going to have those on the label though? Because they you know, a lot of like the packaged foods, like it's, it's like an you know, OBS brand or something where there's like five ingredients on them and that's it when it looks like a you know, piece of flavor. Is that a good refined process? Well, no, like, because, like, is there anything else in there besides these five ingredients? I mean, legally, legally, they, yeah, legally, it has. They have to label it. But, but, but the FDA is also a joke. So. Well, welcome to underfunded government agencies. They do what they can, but it's perfectly okay. So, does that scoop with lard? Is that what I remember you telling us that is lard is if it's hydrogenated, not so good. If it's truly just regular lard, it's fine. In moderation, yeah. I mean, don't go overboard. Don't be like yeah. scooping yeah. it and eating it by the spoonful. Well, it's just, oh, like, that's why we're here. Yeah. Just like the corn syrup and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 High fructose corn syrup is probably the biggest driving factor um, for pretty much every illness and disease. Well, so that, avoiding that as much as possible. Well, yeah. But, you know, the, we're talking about the additives <laughs> in our food, the hydrogenated oils. Um, and that's when you yeah, take a, a plant. So like margarine, because yeah, they, they're like butter's awful because it's 
got fat. So, and so they made margarine. And margarine is a plant plant sourced food that's liquid at room temperature. And they throw a bunch of hydrogen at it to make it shelf stable. And in doing so, they create trans fat. It's man made. It is not healthy at all. We should not have it in our diet, period. So it's not like we're finding saturated fat gets all this bad rep, but it's really like in moderation. Whereas trans fat, like, really don't have it at all. If you can avoid it, please do. Um, and like, they, there's kind of a loophole where they don't need to mark it on the label if there's less than 0.5 grams of hydrogenated um, trans fat in a serving. But a lot of times it's in foods that you eat more than a serving because serving sizes are sometimes ridiculous. So if you're eating, yeah, if you're eating, you know, four serving sizes and there was 0.5 grams in there or 0.4, well now you've had two, almost two grams of trans fat and you really shouldn't have any. So that's kind of like the loophole. Snacks, daily recommendations, two snacks that contain protein and fiber to help you fill, fill yourself up. And so this is gonna be like nuts and seeds. Good sources for heart in general, or in particular, I should say, are gonna be like pistachios, almonds, walnuts, um, but any, any nut or seed are good options. Um, chia seeds are also good. Um, and what's the other one? Chia flax, flax seeds. Um, they contain unsaturated fats, which are heart healthy, but check the sodium content. We don't want too much sodium in there. Watch the serving size too. Again, everything in moderation, even though they are good fats, a lot of fat all at once is still not great. And a serving size is generally about a fourth of a cup. So keeping that in mind. Choose crackers, pretzels, et cetera, that contain whole grains if you're absolutely going to, but those are generally more highly refined foods. And so we want to eat those in moderation or on occasion. I think that's more of an on occasion thing um, and not an all the time thing. So again, they contain heart healthy and saturated fats, which can help reduce your LDL. Um, we hadn't really talked about it when I talked about physical activity, but physical activity is going to be the best way to boost your HDL. So that good cholesterol that removes the plaque from your arteries. There aren't really any foods that boost that, like target that. Um, so physical activity is really the biggest thing for that. Um, and check the label ingredients for trans fat or partially hydrogenated fats, which um, Mark alluded to earlier. I mean, so physical activity, I mean, it, is, it looks different for everybody, but they recommend, you know, 30 minutes a day of at least a walk, a light walk um, daily for everybody. So for some people, you know, I know that you, you do like to work out. So for you, I think it's more of lifting weights, maybe a more high intensity cardio workout. Um, but they've shown that simply, you know, especially people who maybe have more weight to lose or can't get around as much, literally just walking a half hour around the block at like, you know, one mile an hour or whatever is enough to be effective and protective to an extent. Just getting up and moving it off your butt. Vigorous. <laughs> Banging your head against the wall. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, oh, <laughs> Good stress management. <laughs> All right, dairy and eggs. Um, one cup of dairy is equivalent to a cup of milk or yogurt. Uh, half a one and a half ounces of natural cheese or two ounces of processed cheese. Eggs are also a very budget-friendly protein source. Milk is a good source. Primary sources of calcium, vitamin D for us, um, which are important for our bones and teeth. They could also help with the artery, preventing the arteries from hardening. And so here I have to put cho choose lower fat options because that's what the governing bodies are still suggesting. Personally, I say full fat options. Um, and again, in moderation, because generally when you remove the fat, you're putting in something else. So it's going to be more refined. So I generally go with the full fat option and just don't go crazy, like have my one cup, like I'll get like whole um, fat plain kefir or whatever and have that or full fat plain yogurt and then add in cinnamon or fresh fruit or whatever to sweeten it. But again, I have to put what the governing bodies say and then I put my little two, two cents in there. Um, dairy products can contain saturated fats, so lower fat versions can limit the intake, but we're finding this is less evil than we think it is. Dairy contains naturally occurring sugars called lactose. And so it's important to note that 
yogurt, for instance, contains added sugar. So a lot of times this is how it is like, oh, yogurt is so health healthy, like yo play. But if you look at the label, there's like 17 grams of sugar in that container. That's a lot of sugar. And yes, naturally occurring is probably anywhere between 10 to 12 grams in about a cup. Um, Greek yogurt, because of the way that it's fermented, contains a little less because probiotics eat the sugar. So there's more like eight to 10. So that's a better option. But if your your um, yogurt has more than like 14, 15 grams of sugar, you probably want to rethink it and find another one. Um, the American Heart Association recommends less than 25 grams of added sugar daily. So that's going to be anything that's in a product where it's not naturally occurring. So even though honey or agave nectar or whatever is a nat maple syrup is a naturally occurring sugar, if it's added into something, it is added. I get that question a lot. So remember, just pour your maple syrup in the cup. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no soda. So they're talking yeah. about you know fruits and yeah. fruit, yeah. foods like fruits, um, <laughs> fruits, and then milk, dairy products are going to naturally contain it. But anything that has an additional thing listed, um, that's added sugar. Frozen food um, is a good option, especially for fruits and vegetables. These are generally picked at peak freshness, and then they also they're flash, flash frozen, and they contain like the entirety of the nutrient. Because remember, we live in Wisconsin; our growth, growing season is short, um, and we're also shipping things in from Guatemala and wherever. And you have to think by the time it reaches you, how much of that nutrition has like denature i never think of what the right word is but like it's not as nutritious anymore because the, that nutrition has started to degrade started to degrade well even worse than that they usually pick it early so that it doesn't spoil by the time it gets to the final yeah and it usually sits in a warehouse for a long time tomatoes and yeah. apples in particular are notorious exactly. for that which means it doesn't ripen on the vine which is the biggest problem that they pick it early right and that's why tomatoes commercial tomatoes taste like crap I, yeah, I always said flavors. I don't like tomatoes, yeah. and then I went to Italy, and for somebody who doesn't like tomatoes, I ate a lot of tomatoes. And I'm sure if you have a garden and you grow your own tomatoes, it's the same thing. Um, but so so frozen options can be great that way. They can be budget friendly, and again, they last longer. I mean, they will get they will get um, frost freezer burn eventually, yeah. but that's a good option. Um, you can throw the frozen fruit smoothies. You can use the frozen vegetables in um, like soups and stews. They make quick sides. Frozen fish thaws very quickly. So if you didn't have an option pulled out for dinner, you know, pulling that out for dinner, trying to choose meals that are less than 500 calories and less than 600 milligrams of sodium. Because the biggest thing here is watching the sodium content on a lot of that freezer stuff. And also even like the, the uh, fresh or the frozen fruit sometimes has like hidden added sugars in it now. So you gotta be careful with that. <laughs> Bacon. <laughs> Limit sodium to 2,300 milligrams per day. Um, foods contain, containing more than 400 milligrams are generally considered high in sodium. Um, and yeah, prepared. Salt. Yep. Everything. Yep. Sodium's good for you. Sugar and salt are kind of the biggest things to watch out for. Um, prepare your meals that you're already making in double batches and then freeze them for later use. Um, that's like my biggest meal prep is like if you're already cooking, just make a double batch and freeze it and then pull it out for that day when it's like hectic and crazy. And I like to freeze it and then throw it in the crock pot and then you have a hot meal ready to go. Right. I feel like I was kind of speeding along, but I don't know when I need to get back in here. So. Yeah. And remember, we have many mulberry trees around Thermotown. You can get your own fresh fruit. It's delicious. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, they, they turn purple. Those are good ones. Yeah. Wash out and find them in the spring. I haven't done that picture in years. I'm very proud of that. If you blend something, like throwing in vegetables and fruits and all that, and blend it in, blend it instead of just eating it raw, raw, is there, but there, obviously you're getting the same nutrients, but do you digest it differently? Yep, so a lot of times, like, it. especially, nope, nope, you shouldn't avoid it. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like there might be a couple things that it might be, what am I trying to say? It oxidizes, which means it deteriorates a little bit. But there are certain foods too, like green leafy vegetables. They've shown that like kale and spinach, because you need to break through that barrier, you need to break through that cellulose, that it's actually more absorbable and digestible when you do cut it up before you eat it. So like blending it. Um, so it depends on the nutrient. Again, there's no like concrete. You shouldn't drink your calories. Are they just talking about booze? 
Soda. Uh, soda. <laughs> yeah, alcohol, because I mean, those are straight sugars. It's literally just sugar. And same with like fruit juice. Like they're always like, oh, fruit juice is so healthy. And we were just talking about this. Like fruit, a cup of fruit juice, is, like orange juice is pretty much, contains as much sugar as a soda. When you eat a piece of fruit, you're eating it in the matrix of the fruit, meaning that you have the fiber and you have the other nutrients in it and you're not just having the straight sugar. So the glycemic load, not the glycemic index, the glycemic load when all those things are put together doesn't spike your blood sugar the same way that just the juice would. And that's the, the same with any meal. Like if you are to eat your fat and your protein before your carbohydrates, your blood sugar is not going to spike as high because you, you kind of buffered that reaction. Um, so the way that you pair your foods is important or the timing of in which you eat them is also important. Any other questions? Yep. And so the way that we do it in this country is backwards. Like you get the bread basket first, or you go to a Mexican restaurant, you get the chips and salsa first, when really you should be eating the protein and the fat first. And that's going to negate some of that spike, which I think is like newer research, but that's what they're finding. Is that the glycemic load is more important than the food itself. The way that you pair things together is more important. And that's kind of why they all, they always say, or recently have been saying, pair a protein or a fat with your carb. Like try not to eat your carb alone. Or so like a lot of times people go, people go to for snacks, like, oh yeah, I eat an apple or a banana. And first of all, the glycemic load of a banana is, or the glycemic index of a banana is insane. So I'm like, yeah, it's a ton of sugar. Like people don't realize how much sugar is in a banana. Now it's naturally occurring sugar, but that doesn't mean that all at once it's gonna not spike your blood sugar. So pair it with, I always do like a spoonful of peanut butter or have a handful of almonds or have a string cheese. Like having some type of fat or protein is gonna reduce. Butter. <laughs> uh, that does not sound appetizing, but well, sure. I mean, but that, that would accomplish. Yes. yes, that would accomplish. You do you, Andy. You do you. you. Heard it. 